Um, all right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. So today uh, we have the pleasure to hear uh, Anna Maria Raclariu. So Anna um, received her PhD from uh, Harvard under supervision of uh, Andrew Strominger, and she's now a postdoc at uh, PI. And uh, she's about to tell us about celestial symmetries and asymptotic charge dynamics. Please. Hey, thank you very much, Mark, for the nice invi uh, for the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, I'm very happy to <clears throat> tell you today about some recent work with uh, Laura and Daniela. So um, to begin with, it's been known for a long time now that uh, at low energies, uh, gravity engaged theories in asymptotically flat spacetimes are governed by a set of equivalences. Um, part of the, uh, these equivalents uh, consist of soft theorems so these are um, results that relate scattering amplitudes with and without uh, low energy massless particles. Asymptotic symmetries, uh, so this should be very, very well known uh, to everyone here. Uh, they are um, essentially large gauge transformations or diffeomorphisms that uh, act non-trivially on the phase space. So uh, they're associated with non-vanishing charges. And finally, memory effects that um, describe changes, permanent changes in the gauge or gravitational potential um, after the passage of gravitational radiation. Uh, so these three subjects are related by um, uh, as follows. So as shown in this diagram. So in particular, soft theorems are related to memory effects uh, by a Fourier transform. Uh, so this is just to say that uh, if we take a classical solution, radiative solution of Einstein's equations, um, asymptotic, uh, such an asymptotic solution, and we take a Fourier transform, we're gonna get uh, back this soft factor. So the soft factor is nothing but the Fourier space version at low energies of this radiative uh, gravitational potential. Um, and by the way, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on gravity, hence I'm illustrating the set of connections for gravity right now. Um, the connection between soft theorems and uh, asymptotic symmetry has been established um, also a couple of years ago, and arises as a conservation law. So in particular, if we take <clears throat> the super translations, which are the infinite dimensional, uh, one of, a part of the infinite dimensional enhancement, of Poincaré uh, symmetries of asymptotically flat spacetimes and consider construct the charges associated to them and then impose that they are a symmetry of the S matrix, that is, they are conserved in time, hence they commute with the Hamiltonian or the S matrix. Um, then we arrive um, at an, an equation like this, which can be massaged um, into uh, the form of the soft theorems. So in that sense, soft theorems arise as ward, arise as ward identities associated with uh, asymptotic symmetries. Finally, I'm not going to be discussing this much today, but the symmetries uh, are related to memory effects by um, a vacuum transition. So uh, this is to say that large gauge transformations or large gauge uh, diffeomorphisms can be used to undo these changes in, um, in the metric uh, that are induced by gravitational radiation. Okay, so um, I've been uh, uh, talking about the leading uh, part, parts of these equivalences in gravity, but you may wonder what about subleading ones. And indeed, um, it's also known for a while that subleading terms in a soft expansion um, so in, in, in this uh, corner, they are also uh, related to symmetries. Um, so if we start with the scattering amplitude of n particles of momenta pi and an additional uh, graviton, so here I'm parametrizing a graviton by a momentum that is null, so we label this q hat and points towards some direction on the sphere, and an energy omega. So in the limit, as we take the omega uh, to zero, one gets back um, the same amplitude, but without this 
uh, gravity and insertion up to a factor. And you can think about this factor as an, a Taylor expansion um, around small uh, energies, omega. So we have a, essentially a Taylor series here in omega, where the first term is the soft uh, graviton theorem, while the subleading term is the so-called subleading soft graviton theorem that was only more recently uh, proven by Kachas and Strominger. Now, these subleading soft theorems at three level, um, they were shown to be associated or be generated by an infinite dimensional enhancement of Lorentz symmetry, similar to how the leading soft graviton theorem is associated with an infinite dimensional enhancement of translation symmetry. Now, um, if you think about the action of Lorentz symmetries at infinity, uh, you realize that they act as global conformal transformations on uh, spheres or cross sections of the null cones. And in particular, these uh, so called super rotations, so these enhancements, they correspond to an enhancement of conformal symmetry to Virasoro. And moreover, uh, these uh, full, let's say, 2D conformal symmetries, they are generated by a stress tensor that um, has a precise expression, so one can construct it very explicitly from a particular mode of the subleading soft gravity. Um, now, if we think about uh, uh, the, the 80s, um, back then, Brown and Henault were studying the asymptotic symmetries of negatively curved spacetimes, and they realized that um, and they were also enhanced to Virasoro. And historically, um, this suggests that perhaps the similar uh, enhancement that happens in four-dimensional asymptotically flat spacetimes should be taken seriously. And so um, one way to do that is to uh, start from symmetries and um, try to look for a new organizing principle for observables in gravity in four-dimensional asymptotically flat spacetimes that makes the symmetries, and in particular this Virasora symmetry manifest. Uh, conventionally, and in textbook quantum field theory, uh, scattering amplitudes are expressed in the basis of momentum eigenstates. So again, uh, uh, particle, so I'm going to be focusing on massless scattering since I'm going to be focusing on pure gravity later on. So massless particles are parametrized again by an energy and uh, two angles or a point on the sphere. And uh, the S matrix of scattering amplitudes are typically constructed by computing S matrices in the basis of such momentum eigenstates. So this is the typical construction of Poincaré representations. So asymptotic states, the lore is that asymptotic states organize into Poincaré representations. But here, uh, since we have this Lorentz symmetry that seems to be important, it uh, seems convenient to try to reorganize asymptotic data uh, according to um, eigenstates of the Lorentz transformations instead. Most conveniently, one can consider an eigenstate of a boost, namely a boost in the direction of the particular mass as particle. And the relationship between uh, these two, so between a momentum eigenstate and the boost eigenstate, is given by a Mellon transform. So this integral transform, what you, uh, you, you should think about it as a just uh, taking a particular superposition of momentum eigenstates that diagonalizes boosts in the direction of the particle. And the eigenvalue under these boosts uh, is called, we're going to call it delta. So this is, you can think about it as a scaling dimension if you want, or you can also think about it as a Rindler energy. So um, upon expressing S matrices in the basis of boost eigenstates, one obtains new observables where well, they're of course related to, to scattering amplitudes um, and they're called celestial amplitudes and they uh, make this symmetries, so Lorentz symmetry manifest in that they, uh, they transform, so the celestial amplitudes transform as uh, correlation functions of primary operators in a two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, okay, so uh, here are a couple of um, uh, facts we know between uh, about this equivalence between uh, essentially scattering amplitudes and celestial amplitudes. So the first one, as I already said, is the fact that 
Lorentz symmetry in four dimensions um, becomes a statement uh, of SL2C covariance of celestial amplitudes. Now you may wonder what happens to translations. Uh, so translations now act non-trivially on the spaces. Um, in, in particular, what they turn out to do is to relate celestial amplitudes involving operators with shifted weights. Um, now, there are a lot of other symmetries in the celestial conformal field theory, and some of them descend from uh, soft symmetries or asymptotic symmetries in the bulk. And in particular, uh, one can show that, in fact, in the celestial conformal field theory, there exists a tower of so-called conformally soft currents at uh, negative integer dimensions, and um, they generate word identities that have to be obeyed by celestial amplitudes. And so the subject of today's talk is essentially trying to understand these. Um, so they've been pretty well studied at this point from a celestial conformal field theory point of view, but the asymptotic symmetry interpretation or sort of the broke interpretation remains more mysterious. And this is what uh, the talk today is gonna, gonna be about. So we're gonna see these a lot more in a little bit. But before that, let me also say that uh, there is other aspects of this uh, dictionary that we understand, so or partially understand. So one of them is the fact that infrared divergences of scattering amplitudes are captured by uh, vertex operators constructed out of Goldstone modes. These are canonically conjugate to these conformally soft currents, um, and these exist in this celestial conformal field theory. And moreover, uh, there's various aspects of uh, mostly four point massless scattering, but also higher dimension, uh, higher uh, point scattering in, in four dimensions. Uh, some of their properties are understood to be obeyed by uh, celestial amplitudes, and in particular, uh, low and high energy properties of uh, such amplitudes are known to be encoded somehow in the analytic structure. Um, of the celestial amplitudes in complex uh, this complex dimension or boost weight and cross ratio uh, planes. Okay, but um, today, as I said, I will focus on on this aspect of conformally soft currents, and so this brings me to the outline. Um, so to get there, uh, I'm first going to review two uh, important uh, aspects of the story. So one of them is. Uh, the subject of uh, universality and pro universal properties of celestial amplitudes in uh, soft and collinear limits. These will, as we'll see, will translate into properties of celestial amplitudes in uh, conformally soft and operator product expansion limits. Then I'm going to be uh, uh, reviewing how it was found from celestial holography point of view that um, these celestial PE of gravitons can be resummed and used to compute an algebra of conformally soft operators. Now, as we'll see, um, sort of the, the bulk inter interpretation becomes uh, less and less clear as we make use of more conformal field theory tools. So um, uh, the next thing, and this is going to be the, the main part of the talk, is going to be to understand what the interpretation of these uh, symmetry algebras found celestially are. So we'll see that there is an emerging W1 plus infinity symmetry um, that we will uh, uh, explicitly identify from a bulk point of view. We're going to construct charges associated to them. We're going to show that uh, the so-called spin to charge uh, in this tower is the one responsible for uh, generating the sub subleading soft graviton theorem while there also exists a tower of higher spin charges that are constructed from appropriate components of the uh, metric in a larger expansion. And uh, these will be responsible for the tower of soft theorems. And moreover, uh, we'll show that their uh, canonical uh, brackets will be uh, at least leading order in, in an expansion in number of fields, uh, the same as the the charge algebra, the same as the this W1 plus infinity algebra that was found in celestial holography. Okay, so um, the the first thing is um, so again are, are the soft theorems. So um, at the beginning, I talked about the leading and subleading soft factors, 
But in fact, if you think about it, this soft limit of a, of a scattering amplitude, you quickly realize that, in fact, you can keep Taylor expanding and adding more and more terms to this expansion in powers of omega. And these, in principle, should provide the better and better approximation to the scattering amplitude. Now, uh, these subleading terms, what do they do? They uh, encode classical uh, information about uh, gravitational radiation. And they also receive loop corrections in general. So in principle, they carry also quantum information. Now, uh, here I'm just going to, to focus on three level. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll be interested in this full tower of, of soft theorems. Um, they are, in general, from a, if, you, if you just try to write down Feynman diagrams, uh, uh, they're pretty difficult to compute because there are a lot of contributions that will uh, come up at subleading orders in a soft expansion. But what we will see in a moment is that there is uh, a way to access these uh, subleading terms in the soft expansion by going to this conformal primary basis. And the way that works is as follows. So let's start with a celestial amplitude. So here, uh, I'm just doing what I showed before, just trading the energies of the external particles by conformal dimensions. And as such, I can just recast the, this uh, momentum space scattering amplitude as some kind of correlation function of operators that are inserted at particular points on the sphere and that carry particular dimensions. And this is uh, just to remind you what the map was between asymptotic massless particle states and uh, celestial operators. Now, uh, it turns out that um, the way to extract terms in a low energy expansion of the scattering amplitude is to compute the residues at negative integer dimensions of uh, one of the insertions, the one associated with a conformal primary graviton. So um, now the, the reason why this works is that is essentially this formula. Um, one can do a particular split of this integral and um, plug in for, uh, for this energy momentum eigenstate an expansion in omega. And then upon performing this integral, one can show that there will be a bunch of uh, poles in, uh, in this formula appearing at uh, negative integer dimensions. And in particular, the residues of those poles will be picking up essentially coefficients in a low energy expansion of this operator. And as such, picking up residues of the celestial amplitudes, these negative integer dimensions, picks up for you uh, terms in a low energy expansion. So these are called conformally soft limits, and uh, it is, uh, we'll uh, focus on, on, on them in the rest of the talk. But uh, before doing that, there is an additional tool that turns out to be convenient, and that is, um, uh, that has to do with collinear limits or operator product expansion limits in the uh, celestial conformal field theory. So collinear limits, again, in the amplitudes community, they're well known. And uh, at three level, uh, the statement is that in the limit, as you bring two uh, graviton, two external particles to be close to one another, the amplitude, again, factorizes. And Instead of a soft factor, now we have this splitting function that um, will have a particular uh, pole as, uh, as the two particles approach one another. So here I'm labeling big P uh, is the sum of the, the two momenta, PI and PJ, which we choose to take collinear. And so um, in this collinear limit, this sum will become proportional to just one uh, null vector, which I'm calling QP, up to an energy that is going to be the sum of the two energies. So um, in this limit, one can work out the splitting functions at three level and also beyond, but uh, I, I will focus on three level in this talk. Uh, and, and in the parameterization of the, of the masses moment I showed uh, you before, uh, and for the case of positive helicity gluons and gravitons, they take simple forms that are just shown uh, here. Now, um, these uh, amplitudes facts, uh, can be translated again to a conformal primary basis. And um, it is essentially these ratios of frequencies of, of energies that are responsible of, uh, of generating uh, so-called operator product coefficients 
in a collinear expansion or an OP expansion of, uh, of gravitons and gluons in a conformal primary basis. So upon going to the, uh, to the Mellon basis, it was shown explicitly that the splitting functions actually uh, uh, become uh, these beta functions. So these are Euler beta functions. I'm not giving, it, it's a simple formula in terms of ratios of gamma functions, but the most important property which we'll be using later is the fact that these, uh, these beta functions have poles as uh, either an argument becomes negative. Okay, so uh, just to sum up, uh, here we have, we have a known uh, collinear factorization of scattering amplitudes in this maps to uh, an operator product expansion of gluons and gravitons on the celestial sphere with OP coefficients that are fully determined in terms of these, uh, in terms of these beta functions. Now, um, uh, it's interesting to also note that from uh, a celestial conformal field theory point of view, uh, these OP coefficients can be determined without reference to the bulk. And uh, the way, one of the ways in which one can do that is by imposing consistency of this operator product expansion with the subleading soft, with the sub subleading soft graviton theorem. So first of all, let me just note that in a conformal primary basis, just conformal symmetry already fixes the form of this leading term in the op OPE of two gravitons to, to be proportional to z bar divided by z. Uh, um, times an, an operator of this form up to a coefficient, which is not fixed by conformal symmetry, but uh, turns out that it can be fixed by uh, a subleading soft, uh, rather sub-subleading soft graviton symmetry. So, so the way it works is that uh, the sub-subleading soft graviton theorems, they are generated by uh, a particular uh, operator. So we're calling this delta here, and one can impose invariance of this OPE under this symmetry. Uh, and upon doing so, one uh, arrives at an identity of this form. And upon matching turns on both sides, one finds a recursion relation for these OP coefficients, which turns to be solved by the uh, beta functions I showed before. So you can also think about this fact as being related to uh, associativity of the operator product expansion involving a conformally soft operator. Now, this is all, all fine, but uh, uh, the statements so far I've been making are about leading terms in a, in a collinear or OPE expansion. Now, since we are in a conformal primary basis, we might try to exploit conformal symmetry and uh, do a bit better. Namely, what one can do, uh, as we know from conformal field theory, is that if, if this operator is a primary or actually a primary descendant, one can uh, actually add a tower of corrections to this operator product expansion that will be subleading in z-bar, but they will resum all of the contribution coming from descendants of this operator. By descendants here, I mean conformal descendants, so SL2C descendant. Well, really, in principle, you'd want to do it for SL2C, but uh, the first step one, one can take is to actually promote SL2C to SL2R plus cross SL2R, which is, uh, from a bulk point of view, it corresponds to promoting, um, uh, to going from Minkowski signature to split 2 2 signature. So, this is something that people do in the amplitudes community often. And they then study holomorphic or anti holomorphic limits, namely limits when zij goes to zero for fixed z bar ij or vice versa. And so, um, upon doing this and resumming all of the descendant contributions with respect to one of these SL2Rs, and in particular the right. SL2R, so we want to resum all terms that have higher powers than z bar ij, one finds an expression of this form. And the main point to notice is that the coefficients in this expansion, they're completely determined in terms of this leading coefficient by just SL2R symmetry. Okay, now uh, this is uh, the, an important formula that was uh, used by Guevara, Himwich, Pate, and Strominger to uh, extract the algebra of this tower of conformally soft operators I described before. And the way that goes is as follows. So um, first of all, starting from this OP, we note that we can take the limit when one of these operators is conformally soft. So namely compute the residue 
when delta uh, uh, of of this OPE as delta I becomes negative or one. So um, naively, you may say, you know, if these OPE coefficients had no poles, then of course that result would give you zero. But here we see, um, since the beta function has poles uh, as one of the arguments uh, becomes negative, we see that this residue actually picks up a finite number of terms on the right-hand side. And so that's the first step finite number of terms survive in the OPE of a conformally soft graviton, which here I'm calling n, and plus denotes its helicity. Here it's a 2, so it's a positive helicity graviton. We're computing the residue, and we're calling this conformally soft graviton. Um, so we arrive at an expression, so I'm not writing this here, um, just schematically uh, uh, describing this procedure. We, are, we can simply arrive at, at an OP between a conformally soft graviton and, uh, and the conformal primary graviton uh, from this formula. And now the second step is to take uh, yet another conformally soft limit on, on, on delta J. And that will... Uh, essentially give an operator product expansion, again, that's completely determined by, by, by this formula here, of two conformally soft gravitons. So um, now using that formula, uh, one can then use the correspondence between uh, operator product expansions and uh, commutators of modes to arrive at an algebra of modes. So what do I mean by modes here? So by modes, I mean uh, furthermore expanding these operators in Z bar. So with respect to the left SL, uh, to, the, to the right SL2R, so we do a mode expansion in, in Z bar. And upon doing that and computing uh, the commutation relations using contrary integrals, so standard CFT methods, one arrives at uh, as an algebra in the celestial conformal field theory, uh, which Furthermore, then one can realize that upon an appropriate rescaling can be recast as a W1 plus infinity algebra. So again, this W generators, uh, um, they, are related, uh, with, uh, they are related with the modes of these NS generators by particular rescaling and, and uh, uh, relabeling of the dimensions. Um, so I, I'm not, I will tell you in a moment what, what these are. We'll, we'll see an interpretation of these in a moment. But uh, as, of, as of now, this is something that comes out of a, of a conformal field theory calculation. So again, this P's and Q's, they're related to the S and S primes. So they're related to the level uh, at which the conformally soft graviton lies. So how soft it is, if you want. So P and Q label their dimensions. They're related to these uh, to, to the dimensions or these S parameters, while M and N uh, label the modes, right? Remember the modes in the Z-bar expansion. So this is, these are, this is the notation, and this can be identified with the W1 plus infinity algebra. Okay, so, um, right. So to, to recap, we have uh, made use of uh, conformal symmetry to uh, resum contributions to the operator product expansion of two gravitons in, um, in, in a two leading order in an expansion in uh, Z12. And um, upon doing this expansion, this allowed us to, this, this allowed uh, uh, Sturm during collaborators to, uh, to co actually compute an algebra of conformally soft uh, gravitons. And, uh, they found some W1 uh, plus infinity structure or some high, kind of higher spin symmetry emerging from this algebra. Um, now, at this point, you may think, okay, we started from something that's well understood, collinear behavior and gravity at tree level, and then we used some th CFT tools. You can think about of them as, as a black box, and then this black box then spit out a higher spin symmetry, but we sort of lost track a little bit about what the interpretation of this algebra is from a both point of view. So the goal of, of, of the rest of the talk is to, um, to show you how one can uh, actually extract these symmetries uh, or identify them in gravity in just four dimensional asymptotically flat space times. And in particular, I'm going to try to, to explain how this higher spin structure emerges. Okay, so, um, so uh, 
here is the, the, the asymptotic structure of an asymptotically flat spacetime. Um, uh, the metric is typically written in bonding gauge, uh, which are coordinates that are well adapted to the study of gravitational radiation. So um, this gauge is chosen such that, uh, I, I probably don't have to say this, but I'm gonna say it, so just repeat it anyways. So the GR mu components are set to zero, and that's a reflection of the fact that we are rather not we, but Bondi, Vanderburg, Metzner, and Zachs in the 60s, they're interested in studying gravitational radiation. And so they were choosing, uh, choosing coordinates adapted to the study of gravitational radiation, such that waves uh, in, in which waves propagate radially and in which uh, wave fronts are spherical. So the Bondi gauge essentially uh, implements uh, that uh, for you, in which case the metric takes a pretty generic form uh, near future null infinity. Um, uh, and it, this, is, this is given in this, by this formula here. So there are a couple of functions here. Uh, one of them is uh, this phi, which is the gravitational potential and one particular component in an expansion of this uh, gravitational potential is the Bondi mass. The Bondi mass characterizes uh, uh, the loss of mass from, from a system that emits gravitational waves. Um, the Another function, or, or rather uh, a vector field here in this notation is uh, this upsilon. This upsilon contains information about the angular momentum aspect uh, that is being carried away through gravitational waves. Um, and finally, there is this transverse metric, um, and a piece of that is uh, the so-called shear. So that appears as a subleading term in, uh, in, in its expansion in large R. And the shear is related by a time derivative to the news, and the news, again, is a measure of the energy carried by gravitational waves. Now, um, the, the way one typically proceeds in uh, studying uh, asymptotically flat spacetimes is to perform a large radius expansion of uh, the metric components and then impose that, uh, that they are a solution to Einstein's equations. And that su as such, one finds a set of connections between the coefficients in a large R expansion. So they're, they are constrained by Einstein's equations. So in practice, uh, what, one, uh, what one does is that uh, at order one over R squared in large R expansion by uh, imposing uh, Einstein's equations. So again, I'm restricting to just pure gravity. And so we're just setting the Einstein tensor to zero. Um, each of these uh, sort of constrained equations gives rise to, to an evolution equation for uh, the Bondi mass, the angular momentum aspect, and uh, a subleading component in an expansion of the transverse uh, metric. And they take this, uh, this uh, very standard form. The, the first two are uh, better known, while this last one uh, has uh, been, at least to my knowledge, uh, much less studied uh, previously, just because probably it looks kind of complicated. So I'm just highlighting here that the evolution of of this particular term in a, in a one over r expansion of the transverse metric also involves the angular momentum aspect and the Bondi mass. And so if one wanted to re-express this just in terms of the news and the shear, one would have to recursively go back and uh, substitute for whatever solutions we get from the previous two uh, constraints. Um, okay, now, and now if, if we want to, uh, to kind of understand the connections between uh, uh, these constraints and the soft theorems, typically what one does at the leading and subleading orders is to uh, write down some charges that they, they are constructed from the Bondi mass and the angular momentum aspect and uh, compute their action on the phase space. And then upon imposing this uh, uh, commutation relations of these charges with the S matrix, as I showed at the beginning, one can, uh, recast this conservation law uh, as a soft theorem. So, so this has been done for the leading two terms. For this, for, there is a natural guess that this last constraint uh, could be associated with the sub-subleading soft graviton theorem. And this is indeed what I'm going to show, but it's something that, uh, that had not been done before. Okay, but uh, 
you know, working with these expressions seems uh, a little bit uh, annoying. So uh, fortunately, um, we had some tools that were developed by uh, Laura and Daniele uh, that, allows, that allowed us to actually recast these equations in a much simpler form. And uh, the main idea behind that uh, be behind doing so is to uh, realize that one, uh, that it, it's convenient to reorganize the set of asymptotic data uh, in, in terms of the uh, extended BMS symmetries. So we want to, to reorganize the components of, uh, of the metric, of the asymptotic metric in a way that transforms nicely under uh, the BMS group and its extensions. So uh, the, the most general uh, form of asymptotic symmetries uh, that, that are known uh, so far are uh, this, uh, this generalized or extended or whatever you want to call it, BMS group. So it's labeled by two functions and a vector field on the sphere. Um, and the idea here is to actually um, study the transformation properties of uh, various uh, objects constructed from asymptotic uh, components of the metric under the homogeneous part of this BMS W uh, group. So the homogeneous part is obtained by setting the super translation parameter F to zero. And upon doing so, one can define primary fields um, as fields that transform in this particular way under this homogeneous part of, um, of BMS W. So uh, here Li, uh, L is the lead derivative with respect to, uh, to Y, and uh, W is, uh, is a function on the sphere, so this labels conformal uh, rescalings of the sphere at infinity, and delta and S are some numbers that will come out of the calculation. I should say that this formula uh, is written for a particular cut U equal to zero on scry. So impose, that we, we want to construct fields that transform in this particular way under BMSW. And if you want, you can think about this condition as some kind of uh, space-time analog of the conformal primary uh, condition or conformal primary state I described uh, at the beginning. Now, as an example, uh, the first thing is that uh, the bondy mass aspect uh, that we saw before is actually not a primary in that it doesn't obey this transformation property. But nevertheless, upon dressing it with this particular, upon adding this particular factor of uh, the shear times the news, uh, one can construct a quantity that is actually primary, and namely it's a scalar, as you can see, of dimension delta equal to three. And then uh, now one can proceed in identifying all primaries to order one over r in an expansion of the metric. So this will account for bondy mass, angular momentum aspect, and this EAB tensor I showed before. So uh, what one can do is to essentially trade these three quantities by uh, space-time uh, tensors that transform as primaries in the way I showed before. And uh, to take this, uh, to, to simplify things a little, uh, yet a little bit more, it's convenient to trade space-time tensors for just space-time scalars by contracting uh, these tensors appropriately with frame fields. So uh, in particular, we have uh, M and MA bar uh, uh, tangent vectors to the sphere, and uh, we can construct positive and negative helicity uh, space-time scalars upon performing those contractions. So um, now we have upon having identified these charges, and there are, we have written down explicit expressions, I'm not showing you uh, uh, here what they are, but the main point I want to make is that upon doing so, the three evolution equations for the bondy mass, angular momentum aspect, and uh, this tensor can actually be written in a very, very simple form as evolution equations for these uh, um, BMSW primaries, for these QSs. And the, these evolution equations take, uh, take uh, the form uh, given here uh, for s equal to 0, 1, or 2. So again, this s here labels the space-time, uh, if you want this, the, 
spin of, of this field. So S equal to zero will correspond to the space-time BMSW primary associated with the body mass, S equal to one is associated with the angular momentum aspect, while S equal to two corresponds to this uh, tensor, tensorial subleading component of the transverse metric. Okay, and, uh, and another thing is that uh, there, there's also, one can also define uh, Q minus one and Q minus two uh, as related to uh, the news, so here have to have to distinguish it from angular momentum aspect, and um, they, they, they take this form. So, um, okay, so now we have this set of, uh, of recursion relations for, uh, for this uh, spin uh, zero to two charges, and one can uh, then solve them, right? We can integrate them uh, with respect to you, uh, provided we choose appropriate uh, boundary conditions. So um, one, of, one of these boundary conditions is that we want to impose that the, that the news falls off fast enough as we take uh, u to infinity. Um, and so uh, this, this is the boundary condition that allows us to integrate these charges and have uh, uh, construct finite quantities. And the other boundary condition, which we are free to choose is the behavior of these charges at the future boundary of scry plus. So impose that they vanish there. Of course, this condition will have to be revisited if we want to introduce uh, massive particles, for example, into the game. But here, again, I'm focusing on pure gravity. Um, okay, so once we impose these conditions, then one can just um, integrate these equations and recursively uh, solve or sort of determine all of these charges just in terms of the news and the shear. And then since... Uh, since uh, this new, so I should have said that they are chosen such, the notation was so chosen such that this corresponds to a negative helicity uh, gravity, and if you wish, and this one corresponds to a positive helicity one, and so they obey uh, canonical commutation relations of this kind. Uh, so this is standard, and um, this uh, then allows us to compute the action of these charges on the phase space. So, um, I should say that, okay, these uh, a priori, they are constructed at any cut u, but actually if, we, if we're interested in, in charges, we know that this should live at the past boundaries of scry plus or future boundaries of, of scry minus. And so in addition to all we've done so far, we also have to make sure that as we take the limit, u goes to minus infinity, the action of these charges on phase space is well-defined. So, um, Indeed, there is one more step we have to do before arriving at an expression uh, of, of, for well-defined charges. Uh, and this is this renormalization here. So um, in order to just make sure that uh, we, we, we have charges that have uh, finite actions at scry minus, one can take this particular linear combination of the charges I showed before, and then what one can show is that essentially these Q hats then have a totally well-defined and finite action. And this this uh, sort of normalization procedure is motivated by imposing that uh, in some sense there is no flux going through uh, the past uh, boundary of scry plus. Uh, now, uh, may I oh, ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah, uh, on the previous slide, actually, I was wondering what is the uh, phase space uh, on which you have these bracket structure? Oh, that is so. So here, everything is expressible in terms of uh, in terms of the news and the, the shear. So the phase space is what you have. Uh, so uh, at some point in the um, We're asymptotic not expansion, you had a uh, phase space in terms of the news and the yeah uh, that's right. so this is so mm, is is yeah, it that uh, is that all or do you have more it's a great uh, yeah so at, at this point this is all we have and we're not okay. no, not considering any, any any enhancement of the of the phase space in this formalism at least so okay. the, there are other analysis but okay but okay thank you point, yeah thank you um Okay, so we have these charges, they're completely determined in terms of the news and the shear, and so we just can compute their action on asymptotic graviton states, if you want, you can think about the phase space as consisting of, of being, in some sense, Fox states of gravitons, if you want, and we can simply compute the actions of the charges on the phase space, uh, 
uh, from brackets of these charges with the shear. So those are essentially the things we have to compute. And that's completely well-defined thing to do because we, we know this canonical bracket. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, is there a, an easy reason to see why this renormalization of the charge requires to, I mean, I can understand the fact that there are these powers of U, but why do you need to take a sphere derivative of the initial Qs to? Yeah, so at first when we did it, it was it was an observation that this is something that ensured that it removes the uh, the divergences as u comes to infinity, but actually you can see them from if we study the constraint the these constraint equations recursively, mm -hmm. one can show that you need these derivatives to ensure that if we consider q dot is q dot at, at each level. So first of all, for s equal to zero, we don't need any uh, any renormalization. Right. Those are going to be the q zeros. At q one, you just need the uh, you need two terms. And you can try to compute q dot one, so derivative with respect to u mm -hmm. of q one. And uh, what one can see then is that that thing vanishes at u as u goes to infinity, provided we are on, provided the constraint at the previous level is obeyed. Yeah. So it's not, and, and the constraints, you know, these constraints they have these, okay. they involve these derivatives here. But, so but in are, that sense. But aren't these quantities the aspects? Oh, yes. Uh, Okay. Indeed, yes, so, yes. But, but this, you... sorry, this D is derivative on the sphere. Yes, but so if you integrate them, then why? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, that's that's a great question. Those would be integrating them would be just the global charges, but we know that even for the leading and subleading global charges, they they vanish. So here we're, we're this you can think about them as really we're, we want to pick up modes on the sphere. So we'd be oh, integrating okay. them against the function on the sphere. And so this derivative won't okay, okay. Uh, trivially be trivial. Okay. Yeah, so that's great. Sorry, Thanks. that's a great point. Maybe just if you want an intuitive uh, motivation for those derivatives is that you need a quantity of spin s. So if you have a charge of spin n, the derivative has spin s minus n. Yeah. Yeah. So it gives you a match the spin of the charge that you want to. That's yeah. absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's also uh, another reason. Okay, so um, okay, so now that are there? Sorry, I should ask. Maybe there are more questions since maybe it's a good point. Okay, so um, now that we have this charge aspect, um, we can uh, do sort of go through through this procedure that establishes equivalences between um, a charge uh, conservation and soft theorems. And in particular, you can write down a matching condition. This matching condition then translates in, into a conservation law. So again, the way I'm talking about conservation here is conservation in time. So, um, so one can then compute this quantity and um, perform an appropriate split um, of, of these charges Q hat. <clears throat> so one can see from the constraint equations that actually these, um, these, these split into a piece that's linear in the fields, a piece that's quadratic in the news and so on and so forth. So at, at, at uh, spin S, there will be a piece that is order S plus one in the fields generically. But upon uh, taking these charges and truncating them to quadratic order and imposing this conservation law, um, one finds that um, for s equal to zero and s equal to one, we recover the uh, leading and subleading soft graviton theorems as, as previously shown. While for spin two, uh, for the spin two charges, we actually arrive at a new conservation law that turns out to be precisely equivalent to the sub subleading soft graviton theorem. And just to show you how this works in practice, um, and I'm gonna illustrate it for this example of Q2. So I'm just rescaling it for convenience. Uh, I'm defining some uh, uh, function on the sphere, some, some, sorry, some other charge T that is related to, to Q2 at U minus infinity up to this uh, factor. And we can then compute in the way I described before the action of this T on the shear. And this is a formula one finds looks a bit complicated, but actually uh, the first term, we can see that uh, this essentially is a linear action, the linear part uh, of this action on C 
um, that takes this particular form. And upon one can massage this into uh, the sub sub leading soft graviton factor, which has been written down in, in, in the literature previously. Uh, and in particular, to do so, one has to actually take a Fourier transform with respect to U of this, because usually, as I said at the beginning, soft factors are expressed in uh, momentum space. So sort of one has to, to, to find the momentum space analogs of this formulas to establish these correspondences. But nevertheless, one finds that everything works uh, perfectly. Uh, now there is another contribution here. So this is a shift um, in C. And this can be actually recast or um, can be shown to arise from uh, the action of the linear component in, in, in T here. So that is the uh, soft charge. And the soft charge upon inserting it into the S matrix, in fact, that corresponds to an insertion of a uh, sub sub leading soft gravitons as one uh, sub soft graviton as one can show. And so uh, these two terms are responsible for actually recovering or establishing the equivalence uh, with the sub sub leading soft graviton theorem. While this last term is, a, uh, is actually a nonlinear um, contribution. So it comes from the, the term in T that is actually cubic in the field. And hence its bracket with, with C is gonna be quadratic in the shear. And so this is a nonlinear contribution. It, uh, it's uh, new, so it has had not been identified before. It's a classical correction to the soft factor, but nevertheless, it's, it's a contact contribution. It's a linear contribution. Um, and uh, as such, uh, typically, you know, when one goes to two to signature, one typically drops these, uh, these collinear contributions because they essentially don't show up in, in Lorentzian, in, sorry, in two to split signature. But uh, this is an interesting new contribution that has to be here due to the nonlinearity of uh, gravity. Okay, so um, now, so what, what we showed so far is the fact that we can recast the leading constraint equations in a much simpler form in gravity. So we arrived at an expression for charges QS for S0, 1, and 2. And I kind of sketched how these charges are related to the, to the soft theorems. But now, uh, in the light of the discussion of the tower of conformally soft theorems before, there is a um, naive uh, generalization of these equations. Um, to arbitrary higher spin S, okay? And um, an, a natural guess is that perhaps these equations could be related to the tower of soft, uh, tower of soft symmetries that I uh, showed before. And indeed, what one can show is that this is uh, the case. So again, uh, to, to show that, um, let me first uh, split these charges so again, I'm considering the, the same renormalization procedure before. All I'm just all I'm doing is I'm promoting this parameter s to just uh, take any positive integer value, and uh, we see that each at each level s the charge can be split into a sum uh, over a linear piece, quadratic piece, and so on and so forth up to an order s plus one piece. Um, in these pieces, the leading one, as I uh, said, as I briefly said before corresponds to, can be shown to correspond to an insertion of a subleading soft graviton at level S. So sub, 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 dot, dot, S times leading soft graviton. So it would pick up, um, if you remember the, the expansion of the amplitudes in parts of omega, it would pick up a particular subleading term in that expansion. While this uh, quadratic charge Q2 um, can again be uh, precisely identified in terms of the news and hence its action on, uh, on the shear can be computed for any S and it takes this particular form. And what's uh, remarkable is that upon uh, going to Fourier space and later to, to Mellon space or directly to Mellon space, uh, if you wish, this bracket can be actually shown to be precisely, to precisely reproduce the uh, term in the operator product expansion of a negative helicity and the positive uh, helicity gravitons uh, that can also be computed using the celestial OPE. And in particular, it's not precisely that term, but it maps onto 
um, an OP that involves uh, S plus two derivatives of, the, of this negative helicity gravity. And uh, as Daniela nicely uh, sort of already pointed out, uh, a di by dimensional analysis, you can sort of count the powers of derivatives here to make sure that uh, these objects have the right dimensions. So these charges S, and let me emphasize again that it, uh, they are objects of delta equal to three, so dimension three and spin uh, helicity, if you want, and helicity S. And so since, of course, all we have in the game are positive and negative helicity gravitons, to construct a helicity S object, object, one has to take an appropriate number of derivatives. Okay, so it's, it's a particular descendant, and in, in celestial CFT, this is also it can be uh, shown to, to, to be a so-called primary descendant. Um, Okay, so, so the, the take home message here is that then upon imposing ma ma matching condition as before, one can show that the conservation for uh, an arbitrary QS charge truncated to quadratic order in the fields reproduces precisely the tower of soft theorems derived in selectual holography. And taking things one step further, one can also compute the algebra of these charges. Um, and in particular, to, uh, well, in principle, this bracket will have uh, nonlinear contributions, but if one restricts this bracket to, to the linear to linear order in the fields, so in particular, uh, that would correspond to computing QS linear with QS prime quadratic, uh, and a particular particularly uh, appropriately anti-symmetrized, uh, one finds uh, a formula like this, and this is nothing but uh, but the W1 plus infinity algebra uh, I showed before, except for I'm not mode expanding here. We can match, one can match to the mode expansion I showed before by integrating this expression appropriately with, with functions on the sphere. So uh, I'm essentially uh, done. Uh, let me say one more thing is that one can also turn the argument around and sort of start from the celestial OPE, kind of take the point of view that the celestial OPE actually in some sense implies a recursion relation for higher spin charges in the bulk. And hence one can think about celestial holography as making a non-trivial prediction for asymptotic charge dynamics in four dimensions, in four dimensional asymptotically bad gravity. Okay, so uh, uh, let me wrap up. So here are uh, a couple of future directions and questions. Uh, so one of them is to um, actually see whether uh, these charges uh, and their full nonlinear expression actually obey uh, this W1 plus infinity algebra. So uh, what is, for example, uh, QS quadratic with QS prime quadratic? And in fact, this is something we're uh, working on right now. And there is some uh, promising progress uh, in this direction. It seems like this W1 plus infinity algebra actually persists. Um, now, another question is uh, about what the relationship, precise relationship is between these recursion relations and Einstein equations. They are certainly a particular truncation of Einstein's equations, but for S greater than four, there will be actually corrections. So nonlinear corrections to this equation. And indeed one can also see them by studying the celestial OPE. So it would be very interesting to see whether one, one can um, use symmetries, for example, to actually constrain the form of those corrections further. Um, now, another question, which is more celestial CFT oriented is what is the relationship between uh, primary descendants or taking these derivatives to make this higher spin operators versus the so-called light transform, which essentially turn, ha has the same effect in terms of dimensional analysis on the operators. So these have been uh, uh, better studied in the celestial CFT and uh, there is clearly a relationship between charges and light transforms, light transform operators in uh, celestial CFT, but the relationship, I would say, still has to be understood better. Um, and finally, there will, of course, be uh, uh, higher derivatives and quantum corrections to all the formulas I have shown. Everything was about three level, so it would be interesting to explore uh, constraints on such terms further and um, as, as well as uh, to have a better understanding of what precisely these uh, new uh, 
charges, what, what sort of symmetries they are associated with. I haven't really uh, said much about that, but it turns out that they're not associated with diffeomorphisms, but they're associated with so-called pseudo vector fields, which is expected, uh, which, which would uh, obey some W1 plus infinity algebra. Finally, uh, understanding observational implications of these through memory effects and so on would be, would be a very interesting thing. And, and the list is longer, but I'm gonna stop here since I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Anna Maria. Okay, so we have time for some questions. Anyone? Yeah, I'm not sure how clear. Or, yeah, it was a bit. There's two things I wanted to connect, and I'm not sure how familiar people are with, especially the celestial stuff, which I haven't been maybe had time to. I, maybe I can break the ice with a question about the uh, renormalized angular momentum. I was wondering because you didn't uh, uh, comment much on. Uh, different options that are there in the literature. And so I was wondering whether this gives you a relation to the, the one that is being used by compare Fiorucci and Ruzziconi or there's yeah, no- Yeah, I mean, ultimately it should be, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I know that there are different proposals in the literature, but in, in some sense, um, since there exists, I would say that there exists this connection to the, to the soft theorems and whatever prescription is, if it reproduces the soft theorems, I would say that, so- But if you look at the explicit expression, can you compare the explicit expression or is it not possible? Isn't it the same I, that you have actually? No, it, it is, sorry, yeah, it is possible. It's the, so the one that wins the lottery is Nichols. So in the paper by Compare and Nichols, they have a parameterization with alpha. And I think it's alpha equals zero, which is the, the right guy. So, so you 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 renormalize the Q one is then not uh, uh, the one that compare likes to call the covariant uh, angular momentum. I I am not sure. I would have to to look at uh, at uh, his parameterization. But I, I checked in the paper by uh, yeah by I mean I, I I know that the one that works is Nichols, and I, in yeah which is alpha equals zero. Um, I, what what Compare has is is not working purely in the radiative phase space. He adds extra uh, edge modes fields if you want. So then, when you have edge modes field, you have extra possibility and splitting there. So uh, so this you're you're not adding. No, it's purely in the radiative phase space. I see. I see. So you're yeah. okay. So you're not all, okay. 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 There's no like uh, electric shear at minus. Uh, U equal minus infinity in this. Well, you don't add the translational field if you want to. I mean, you could, that, 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 that could be the next step. What, what do you get when you add these extra fields? And maybe, yeah, uh, maybe can you, can you link this symmetry to some kind of uh, over diversion, diffuse symmetry? That's the conjecture of, of Alloc, but that, that cannot be done within the radiative phase space. Um, sorry. And additionally, there is also, okay, I haven't had time to, to go into that. There is also similar thing one can say about the leading, uh, this, the leading charges. So here they're constructed, I haven't maybe been very clear about it, but they're constructed from so-called complex mass. So it's a linear combination of this object and the dual mass. And upon doing so, one has one one can avoid sort of using these prescriptions that were originally proposed by, by Strominger. Uh, to recover the soft theorem. So in some sense, even at a more leading order there is, but nevertheless, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the two approaches are equivalent. Okay, but the- But, but, the but the approach 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 approach. had to impose, sorry, it had to impose another constraint because he had set the dual mass equal to zero. And so he had to additionally impose some uh, sort of matching to, to make sure that. I guess, for instance, one thing that you can nicely check is that your uh, Q1 uh, renormalized, uh, it's Poisson bracket with the shear, 
gives you the expected transformation you would like to have from uh, uh, the angular momentum. It does. It was one of the requirements that these people had to select their... No, but of course it does. I mean, I we have computed them, right? Like this is a formula. This this is for 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 if you set s equal to one, and actually it's not obvious from the way I've written it here because it's written for arbitrary s. But you can, I mean, we have matched. You know, I haven't shown here the leading and subleading ones, but of course we 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 get the correct transformation properties under super rotations by acting with q one. So, so in that sense, this is this is why I was saying that we are matching. In some sense, we're matching to the soft to the subleading soft theorem, and that ensures that the quadratic charge gives you the right action on the shear. And so, this is why my guess was that okay, I'm not. I, right. There's but, a lot of literature on the subject, and I don't know every single detail in every every one of it. But I'm convinced that comparing and collaborators have made sure that the action is. I mean is the right one. And in that sense, I would have thought that this matches uh, their analysis. Okay. And then I would like also to hear your take on, uh, on uh, a point that you also mentioned, like interpreting this transformation as a, as a symmetry, because it's not a diffeomorphism on the right. What is your, what are your thoughts about, uh, how would yeah, you like to- uh, We thought on, we have discussed this and in fact, uh, but I want to know what you think, no, what Laurent thinks. Um, I what Laurent no, thinks. I honestly, I mean, okay, I have actually did, I did, I wanted to understand this better because I know that, uh, you know, in celestial holography, I think people really want to match these with diffeomorphisms. So, uh, and I think, I think this is a fair thing. In my opinion, okay, naively, I think this W1 plus infinity algebra cannot come from a diffeomorphism, right? I don't, I don't see any way in which you can get this algebra from a diffeomorphism. Now, um, you could imagine that somehow if you include this overleading uh, diffeomorphisms as suggested by uh, Campilia and Lada a while ago, that one may be able to find similar expressions at the end of the day. So upon including this, so we discussed this actually uh, with, with, with Laurent a while ago that it's a calculation I really want to do and I haven't done yet, but uh, you, you can construct, you can start from the, you can try to construct the charges they have and uh, kind of perform this or somehow like there's this normalization procedure that eliminates, that ensures that there are no terms that blow up with R in the charges and so on and so forth, and then arrives at, at some expressions for the charges. And the analysis in Campilia and Lada suggests that the charges they have upon doing this procedure, they end up with the same charges we have at the end of the day. So in some sense, this is not, it's, I don't think it's intention, for example, with, with that analysis in, in this sense. On the other hand, this also suggests that somehow if you start with an overleading diffeomorphism and kind of restrict to a particular, somehow these charges will end up being associated with a particular subleading term in this overleading diffeomorphism. And, you know, by imposing the fact that, that these are diffeomorphisms and they preserve the bonding gauge, you're gonna get a recursive differential equation that will relate subleading terms in the diffeomorphism to the leading ones. And you can imagine seeing some kind of inverting this relation will generate again some kind of like pseudo vector field action perhaps and kind of by studying that you may you may be able to um to understand like yeah to understand these these pseudo vector fields better but i would say that i mean i, I, I so it would be very do, interesting if these could be seen from overleading things so yeah. you do think that there might be a connection with diffeomorphisms in the end through the in the end, but I don't, yeah, but I don't fully under, I couldn't say right now. C certainly, I don't see how just keeping the full overleading diffeomorphism and computing that algebra would give W infinity from the get-go, like just, just by doing that. But, but isn't using an overleading diffeo somehow equivalent to just extract, extracting the subleading contribution to the charge for, from a usual diffeo, a non-overleading diffeomorphism? Right. That's right. But then these charges would just be just subleading pieces of a usual diffeomorphism charge, right? No. 
Yeah, I think so. They will be, yeah, that's what I was saying. In, in, sorry, this was a better way to say mm -hmm. it. I, I'm trying to say that, yes. But I, I am talking about computing just like some, the algebra of the vector fields themselves rather than the charges. Yes, yes. Uh, do, don't you expect a non-local uh, field theory on the gravity side? Because you have these uh, integrals over u, which is the time direction. So on the, on the celestial CFT, it's OK. Uh, on the CFT side, it's OK to have the W infinity algebra. But if you want to find a gravity dual, don't you expect it to be non-local in time? Well, if you're strictly on scry, yes, it looks non-local in time. I agree with that. But it's coming from the fact that, I mean, at the end of the day, Einstein's equations, when you invert them, they give you non-local expressions for subleading components in terms of leading ones, right? It's essentially, right? If I think if I want to compute what EAB is, I would have to integrate over time this equation. Right, and then and you, you would need more data. Exactly. So you have to extend yeah. your phase space. Uh, and I'm just confused. Is it also, maybe Laura knows the uh, answer to my question. If you include the edge modes correctly, do, do you then expect the non-localities to go away? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know you want to answer. Well, I mean, in some sense, okay, I haven't said this, but we're trying to understand that a little bit better. I mean, there is a sense in which one can, okay, it depends on what you mean by edge modes, but I think there is a sense in which one can trade the news and the share for just edge modes in some sense. And like, I know that there is also like the stuff by Campilia and Ada with like extending the phase space to include more things, but I'm not sure if those things in what way they're related to, to, to what we have here. Because, well, I mean, again, we discussed this before, but I don't think that, that the analysis here, for example, violates any boundary conditions, uh, which I think was part of the motivation for introducing those edge modes to begin with. But, oh, any, anyway, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one, yeah. one other idea is that, it, I mean, you were sticking with the gravitational phase space and it's clearly non-local as, as you were saying, Sushita, along the, the null rays. But, you know, in history, we haven't come to this, the same type of thing. Suppose you try to express physics purely in terms of gauge invariant variables, then the dynamic will look non-local. And then usually what you find, what you try is find, you know, it's always suggests that there may be um, another formulation where, where the symmetry is acted upon locally. So that could be another option. And, and that means maybe this is where this edge mode will come from. Or uh, another, you know, um, conjecture here is that this is maybe what uh, twister is about. So, that, you know, when you, when you have a twister formulation of gravity, it is, a, the twister is a very non-local object from the gravitational perspective. And, and the symmetry now becomes local in twister space. So there, there's maybe, you know, it's hinted at, uh, at that, that uh, maybe, uh, you know, this space-time formulation might not be the, the one where it's the, where the symmetry appears in the clearest manner. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. I, it was just a speculation, so I was just trying to understand what could be the way out. But uh, yeah, as you said, twisters are, are a potential candidate, I guess. Yeah, and maybe also some dressing fear yeah. or maybe, something. Maybe some, yeah. yeah, maybe some dressing field as Anna was saying is 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 you know uh, the, the dressing field were required if you want to change the boundary condition so you relax the, the right. usual boundary condition then you need infinite hour of dressing field so then you could ask whether you know once you have all these wrecks their dressing field you know like it's like you gauge the theory you know then then the symmetry becomes local and then of mm -hmm. course when you engage it it looks non-local so that could be that's also a, a very valid conjecture at this stage. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so the result also depends on a choice of boundary condition in order to invert D over DU, right? And how, uh, like how strong is that dependence? Could you uh, allow for different types of boundary conditions and still be able to recover the structure or there's something uh, really crucial about your, the choices you made? 
I think we should be able, I think we should be able to at least generalize this to when one has massive particles, in which case one would have to change boundary conditions. But or, or all of the your, your boundary conditions are such that the ADM mass is zero, for instance, or is a non-zero ADM mass allowed? No, I don't think there's such that the ADM mass is zero. No, for sure not. Okay, so that you can allow. Yes, yes. You just you only want yeah, what? no I, incoming I, radiation. Is that what you're? What, the what, ADM mass. Let, let me just say it again. I mean, the ADM mass is just related to to Q zero, and that's certainly non-vanishing because it allows you to. It's it's right. What, sorry, what were the boundary conditions again? Uh, let me see here. It's 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 this fall of condition on the news. This is, but also all the renormalized charges. You're asking that they go to zero, right? No, 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 no. 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 Is that the limit of you? These are totally non-zero. I mean, no, this, these are ah ah. No, no, no. Sorry, are... the normalized ones are little q and curly q are non renormalized Yes, yes, that's ah, right. Okay. Right. So this but curly also, q. Sorry, curly q. It's it's not u plus infinity. Ah, u plus minus infinity. It's what are, what were the sorry, what were again what were the curly q? The curly q's are the ah, objects yes, the aspects, that are primaries uh, that are like naively just primaries with respect to BMSW. Okay. The things that you'd get on the nose by, by doing that analysis. Then you have to massage these in a way that their action on phase space is finite. And this is where the renormalization comes in. And okay. and this is not right. And the fact that they vanish, you know, they vanish at some cut doesn't mean they vanish on any cut, right? So they're not vanishing, certainly they're not vanishing on scry. Neither the big cues nor the little ones. And for all of these, it's enough to, uh, do you really need to use BMSW or you can use just uh, generalized yeah. BMS? No, I think generalized BMS is enough. Uh, this is actually my question to, to uh, Daniele uh, earlier, it was, I, it's, of course, it's a question for, uh, for Daniele and Ramor, but my understanding from what they're saying is that it's a nice way to sort of keep track of, of this factor here rather than get it mixed up with, I mean, for generalized VMS, this W would just be related, it's like half dy or whatever, so you could, everything would go through in that case as well, but this way it allows you to isolate this dimension minus spin thing better. But as you did, Simone, right? You can just get these primaries from the vial tensor and then the evolution equations are just the Newman panels. You don't need that. Yeah, so it'd be nice at some point to find some more stringent physical reason to believe in this BMS dub extension. Maybe the connection with the uh, finite distance group is the strongest one. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I have maybe a last question. I wanted to know if somehow we could understand this renormalization in U from the point of view of um, kind of renormalization of the potential, because usually we renormalize in R, but that's also mm -hmm. because the, the slicing is adapted to doing this because the expansion is in R. But uh, that's the. It, Maybe this suggests yeah. that we should control the expansion in U also and renormalize. That's a great question. I've been a bit confused about R versus U because, well, one thing I've been recently confused about, so I can tell you about it is, I'm not sure if it's related to your, your question in particular, but it's the fact that those charges are supposed to be re related to, to subleading soft gravitancy theorems, and we know from, gravitational waveforms, for example, that people uh, can compute from scattering amplitudes, um, the radiative terms in uh, just one of our components in such an expansion. And it, there is a sense, and I may be misunderstanding something, but there is a sense in which the, this tower of soft theorems, in, at least in their analysis from scattering amplitudes, seems to appear as a coefficient of the one over R term. But nevertheless, if you look at that formula, I'm not, you know, this formula is for uh, waveforms in terms of five point amplitudes involving some soft emission, there seems to be an expansion in U as well. So in some sense, there may be some kind of order of limits. There has been also like this 
thing in the literature is saying that if you take the soft limits versus the large R limits that they don't commute. So if taking one first versus the other one is not, not the same. So, I mean, I don't, I'm a bit confused by that, I have to say, but um, I think I'm, yeah, I think it should be better understood. Randomization mm -hmm. in U versus R. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there further questions? Okay, if not, we can warmly thank Anna again. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you thank for you, Anna. Thank you. Thank